I'm Cheryl Burns, the Project and Outreach Manager with Capital R, C, and D, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. This webinar is specific to high tunnel cover crops, and I'm excited to have Steve Groff of Cedar Meadow Farm to talk with us this morning. Funding for this webinar series uh, is provided by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. This webinar is specific to high tunnel cover crops, and I'm excited to have Steve Groff of Cedar Meadow Farm to talk with us this morning. Funding for this webinar series uh, is provided by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. And they've provided, uh, they have funds and technical support available for eligible applicants that can be used to purchase high tunnels for, um, for your farm. Uh, I'll provide a link in follow-up materials that I send out after the webinar, including a survey. Um, and anyone that's interested in learning more about NRCS's uh, high tunnel program or their other conservation programs, um, you can find a link to your local NRCS office and contact them directly. Before turning the webinar over to Steve, I'll also note that if you have questions during this presentation, feel free to either send them via chat or use the raise your hand feature, and uh, both Steve and I will be monitoring that, um, and he's willing to take questions during the webinar, but will also allow time after the webinar for questions and follow-up discussion. So with that, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Steve and thank him for joining us this, after, this morning. Well, right. Oh, Cheryl, thank you. It's uh, a pleasure to be have this opportunity and appreciate those who are interested in this. Uh, I want to start out by saying a brief history and in my involvement with high tunnels and cover crops. And usually we think of these as two separate topics. Uh, but, but here more recently, uh, I think because of the uh, success that cover crops have had out in we'll say the fields, the desire to increase soil health is increasing no matter how we grow our crops. And there has been a renewed focus now on using cover crops as a tool to help our soil health in the context of our high tunnels. And I uh, just going to uh, share briefly here my history in this. I started high tunnels back in the late 90s, I believe it was, uh, with a small, a very small high tunnel. And um, it was uh, kind of a, a, almost an experiment, if you will, on, on what I was doing. And 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 I uh, realized the, the benefits that they could bring could really enhance my vegetable growing operation. And after a couple years of a very small 14 by 96 high tunnel, I uh, graduated to a bigger one and actually went uh, full scale. And I got one acre of high tunnels, uh, the multi-bay high tunnels that came out. Now, right around this time, I also had uh, one of the early Penn State, uh, I guess you would say small research type high tunnels that I used here as well. So that's kind of how I got my feet wet. But in the uh, early 2000s, I think 2001 it was, I put up one acre of multi-bay high tunnels. And I believe it was one or two years later, I got another acre. So I had two acres of high tunnels. And then the last two years, I uh, uh, had uh, Caitlin, who was working for me, had uh, had gotten married and her and her husband brought another high tunnel to the farms. So we were up to three acres the last two years of high tunnels. So for Pennsylvania, a fairly significant effort in high tunnel production. So uh, Caitlin and, and her husband, Mike, have since uh, bought a farm. So they've taken their high tunnel, their one acre. So I'm going to be back to two acres this year. So that is my my experience in high tunnels, I guess I'm coming up here in about 18 or 19 years of, of that. And uh, those of you who know me from my cover crop educational efforts know that I have the whole farm using no tillage and uh, using cover crops for the last uh, 25 years or so. And so I always have somewhat struggled, I guess, with being able to employ 
these practices in my high tunnels of cover crops and no tillage. So I've been um, trying to, uh, you know, employ some of these practices. Uh, the picture you see here is is, is actually uh, shaping the beds, getting ready to uh, put down a landscape fabric. And that's what I had done for several years. And I just left the beds in place. In other words, I did not rework the beds every year. So it was kind of a hybrid system of no-till, you might say, in that I just simply did not work them every year. And uh, it, the nice thing about this is it kept moisture down within the high tunnels so that early on when the tunnels are closed up, you don't have that condensation dripping down the plants and keeping things wet. So this really helps with that to do it in that manner. So that's what we have done for uh, quite a few years. And as I said, it was, uh, you know, worked well, a nice environment for the tomatoes to grow in. And I'll just mention too that I'm primarily working with tomatoes. I did have a couple years where I had one bay with raspberries, uh, but then I lost the market I had for that. So I switched everything back to tomatoes. So um, just getting comfortable with the high tunnel system and how we grow the tomatoes and everything is, is always a process, a learning experience. But I would say we got fairly comfortable in doing that with pretty much the commercial type tomatoes. But then in about 10 years ago, we started growing heirloom tomatoes. And that's really where the tunnels shine. Uh, as you know, heirloom tomatoes do not hold up to wet weather or rains. They tend to crack really easily. And by having the concept of high tunnels, it's really, really advantageous to grow heirloom tomatoes. So for the past 10 years or so, we have been growing heirloom tomatoes in our high tunnels to take advantage of uh, what they have to offer. Um, so one of the things that is, um, I guess a problem that I kind of start feeling was because I have my soil totally covered with all the advantages it brings with that landscaping factor, uh, I am not doing my earthworms and my soil biology much favors because uh, we all know that the way a soil is designed to function is to be able to breathe, uh, to be able to have earthworms and uh, a lot of biological life in it. And I felt like I was hampering that. I felt like I was doing the exact opposite of what I was teaching to do out in the fields. And to try to, I guess you'd say, uh, translate what I was doing in the fields into the high tunnels is not an easy task. And I do remember uh, one of the early years before we used landscaping fact, uh, fabric, you know, we just had a tremendous problem with weeds. And as you could expect, uh, the tomatoes grew great, but so did the weeds. Uh, so uh, that was a challenge, and that's one of the reasons we go to some sort of a protective barrier. And there is all kinds of different ways. There's different kinds of plastic you can use and so forth. But I just want to share with you a little bit where my thinking is right now and what I'm planning on doing now. I will say that there is no one recipe to make cover crops work in the context of high tunnels. Uh, there's a lot of variables that will really depend on your experience, what your objectives are, and maybe more importantly, what crops are you growing? Uh, tomatoes is one of the most popular crops in high tunnels. so. That's what I do. That's what I'm going to be focusing on today. So I hope that this will at least give you some ideas to to try, to try maybe this year or to think ahead next year because using cover crops does require foresight. It requires planning. You have to get it into your system of growing. And most of the times that takes uh, quite a bit of uh, thinking and strategy on how to do this. And I'll just, uh, I know I'm going to summarize uh, at the end by saying to start small, but I'm going to say it up front here. Since this is a new practice, uh, and since we're talking about high value, crop, uh, high value cash crops here, we want to be really careful 
that we in, in our experimentation and our trying of new things that we we don't get ourselves in the corner and really uh, have a detriment to our uh, cash providing crops. So kind of want to put that caution out there right up front uh, before I make recommendations. Uh, think small here. So I'm going to go through a, a couple options. And like I said, there is no one way, but a couple options. So let's just say option number one, I'm going to say is the, the easier one, if you're, especially if you're just starting this. And uh, I, I would I also want to acknowledge that some some of you are more advanced, some of you are brand new, so it's a little uh, going to have to share a couple different uh, aspects of this in in and how you approach it. So let's talk about the first option here, and that is let's start in the fall when we take out our old vegetable plants. Now, there are, again, different strategies on when you take your vegetable plants out, when they're finished in the fall, when the frost comes, or even sometimes before the frost, there's not much fruit left and it's maybe not worth harvesting. Uh, it certainly is easier just to let things go and let the plants uh, naturally die, and then they're easy to pull out once they dry. Uh, and that has really been what we have done over the past a decade or more and just left the plants there. But uh, there has been uh, noted advantages to take those essentially uh, j just just killed or almost yet green plants, uh, tomato plants or whatever, whatever you have there, take them out, pull them out, get them out of the high tunnel, and then you have the ability to plant cover crops in there. Um, I, I do know that there are some who have tried just sprinkling a few cover crop seeds into the holes where the plants were growing out of sometime during the summer. That's very limited. However, it may be some benefit there. Might be something some of you might want to try. But um, taking the old vegetable plants out in the fall, we want to try to get a cover crop mix in. Now, my first cover crop mix here is going to be one that winter kills. And this is why you have to think about what you're trying to accomplish, and then you have to get the species that will accommodate that. So in this case, an earlier planting, and, and also I would add an easier way to be able to manage cover crops is to plant those species that are going to winter kill. And uh, th this is something that's just important to know so that you don't kind of get yourself in the corner in the spring and don't know what to do with a massive living six foot rye or something like that. We're going to talk about that coming up here, but, uh, but so just, you know, I, I would suggest if you're new to this, use cover crops at winter kill. So let's, let's take our vegetable plants out in the fall and, you know, whatever row covers you or ground cloth you have, plastic, whatever, get that out of there. Uh, if you're going to level out your beds, get that done, get that accomplished, and then plant your cover crops. Now, I'm suggesting here a very simple, very easy mix that is proven to be effective. Uh, three pounds per acre of radish, 25 pounds per acre of spring oats, 20, 20 pounds of spring peas. All these were winter killed. Um, uh, pretty, like 95% during winter kill here in uh, in southeast Pennsylvania. So I put this in pounds per acre. Of course, if you're small, uh, smaller scale, you can just adjust accordingly to uh, pounds uh, per square foot or, or seeds per square foot, whatever you want to figure out there. But this is just a guideline here of approximately how many, uh, what your seeding rate should be. So you may have to, depending on how you're able to seed this, there are some small drills that can actually go through high tunnels, or you might have to spin it on by hand. You might have to stir it up a little bit. Then the next question is, uh, how close are you to the time where you need to take off the row, the um, the cover, the plastic? Because it would be ideal to close the tunnel up and to water this cover crop. That's another issue that comes up. How are you going to water it? And a lot of times 
the way our high tunnels are, their cash crop is watered with drip irrigation. So that's probably not going to be effective to irrigate your cover crop if you have it broadcast. Uh, so here we come into a reality here of how do you irrigate unless you can put, if you're small scale, you want to put some sprinklers in and you can move them around to get the cover crop germinated. That's what I did the first time when I had just a small tunnel. I just had a like a lawn sprinkler and just moved it around and got it germinated and you close everything up and you could really make things nice and warm in there and uh, and get that cover crop growing because typically you're at the end of the season here. You want to maximize the time. You want to maximize the use of the plastic. However, most high tunnels are designed to be take the plastic to be taken off during the winter. So if you take that off, then you're losing the ability to keep it warm, but you're gaining the ability to get uh, natural rainfall in there. So a lot of compromises here, a lot of variables. You're just going to have to decide what time of the year is it. What are you willing to risk by leaving your plastic on? If it is a small high tunnel and they're calling for a wet snow that might be coming up or freezing rain that could literally uh, destroy your tunnel, then you're going to have to make that judgment call, uh, understand the risk that you have there. So uh, so this is one aspect here of one approach to be able to do that. The idea here is to get something growing over winter and and it's going to help your soil and it's going to winter kill. Uh, these All these cover crops here will winter kill when the uh, temperature gets in the mid-teens for a few, uh, week, few uh, nights, I should say. Okay, now let's fast forward to the spring. Let's say I got an effective stand. Most people are probably going to re rework their beds in some form or fashion. You may be laying plastic. Um, and he here's where we start moving into a more committed role of uh, cover crops in high tunnels during the growing season. So what I've just shared was over the winter to try to remediate the soil. But now some of the ideas that I'm going to be testing here is using plastic, uh, like normal plastic that is used in high tunnels. And I know some have used biodegradable and, and I'm not gonna discuss the pros and cons of that in this webinar. But uh, the idea here is to get our, our, uh, our, our, our beds made and then to plant some low growing cover crops between the rows. Uh, Dutch white clover is a favorite here because it's low and it, it's a legume. It, it uh, provides its own nitrogen. And then there's a new annual ryegrass called Lowboy. And if you can't guess, that means it's a low grower. That's what we want in this situation. So the combination of these two seem to be a perfect match to be able to plant between the rows. Now, I don't expect that this will equal the same amount of condensation, um, uh, I guess I will say, uh, ability to limit condensation in a tunnel, especially early on when you have the everything closed up, trying to maximize heat. But it's going to help, I believe. And uh, the point of this here is to keep the biology functioning in our soil over the summer, because that's been the problem. That's been the challenge, uh, not being able to keep the biology functioning. And this here should provide a decent place to walk and it shouldn't be too invasive of growing too tall. Now, um, even white clover, clover, which is low growing, can, can get a foot or more tall, but usually frequent foot traffic kind of keeps it down and it doesn't seem to be a problem. Uh, I would be prepared for the possibility of maybe have to trim it sometimes. Uh, I don't suggest a weed eater unless you're really careful because the weed eater can um, can blow little tiny specks of of the of what you're cutting and if it hits young like young fruit it can actually permanently uh, scar it up a little bit and I've seen that happen by weed eating on our leg rows and so forth before so that's just a little caution. Uh, there's rear discharge mowers that they're available to get through, and the, there are some things out there. But if you use the right species here, I don't think you're going to have to worry too much about about this. So uh, <clears throat> this, to me, is the the best idea we have going forward in trying to keep 
are um, uh, biology active, I will say. Now let's talk to let's talk about option number two. This is a little bit more management intensive. Um, nothing has changed in the in the fall the way establishment goes. So I'm not going to go over how to establish it, but it, but I will tell you that now the species are different, except the radish. I want to leave a little bit of radish in there, just as so nice in the fall. Really is aggressive. It roots down in. So let's keep our radish in here. But we're actually targeting now the aspect where we want our cover crops to overwinter as we're as we're kind of trying to keep everything alive. And I'm speaking from a biological perspective. So I'm suggesting a 20 pound per acre of cereal rye and 15 pounds per acre of hairy vetch. Uh, these are the most popular cover crops to overwinter. Uh, there are other ones out there like uh, crimson clover. I want to keep this simple today. So let's just stick with these two. And um, here it's not as important to keep the cover crops growing as long as possible by leaving the, the plastic cover on. Uh, so if, if, if some winter weather is coming in and you need to take that plastic off, you're not going to lose as much here about potential because it will grow in the spring. It's going to survive the winter. So uh, that's, that's, what's, that's what the beauty is about this. Um, about this type of a crop here. So um, as we as we continue to think about this, it's very important in the spring that you monitor the growth of the cover crop. Uh, any if you have any experience with cereal rye uh, and even hairy vetch during the latter end of April, it's really going to grow quickly, and it can get out of control really fast. So. The thing about it is, though, with vegetables and high tunnels, generally we're going to be working in our high tunnels anyway. We're going to want to get the beds made or, or, or however we're approaching it here uh, in April. So that's probably not going to be a problem, but I just need to kind of put a warning out here that if you leave this go, it could get really tall quickly. Now, that may be there may be some situations where you want that where you want a tall cover crop, where you want a hairy vetch to maximize nitrogen production. <coughs> Excuse me. Or something like that. But um, so if it's relatively small, depending on what your approach is, you can just go in and, and disc it up or whatever you do and make the beds. Again, you're going to have to deal with some growth here in the spring. And uh, I will tell you that Making raised beds can be challenging if you have more than eight to ten inches of growth in the spring. So something to keep in mind here. So it really does come to what your experience level is, and um, and so forth. So just just really uh, want to want to remind you of that. That uh, that's something to really be aware of. I would say if you're if you're new to this, you want to make sure that you go earlier rather than later. So there's different ways to uh, control the, that cover crop that overwintered. You can, like I said, you can go in and till it. Um, you could go in and terminate with a herbicide. Typically that would probably uh, glyphosate. Um, so there's a, there's a few different ways to approach that. Um, and uh, then once you do that, I would say that you're going to use your same mix in the row middles, the Dutch white clover and a low boy annual ryegrass. That is going to be the same as I had described previously. I did want to provide another option here that some people might be interested in because it's used um, outside uh, in field production, and that could be terminating with roller crimping. Uh, that would probably limit you to maybe not having raised beds, although I have seen rollers designed to be able to function on raised beds. So I wanted to mention it here. It's certainly something that I have been working with over the years out in the fields. So I understand how it works and and everything, and it, and it might be an option, but this is, this is advanced management now. Again, you may need some herbicide, or if you're organic or want to stay away from herbicides, you can roll it two times sometimes to get a good enough kill. 
I want to uh, caution, though, that in order for a roller crimper to terminate a cover crop, that cover crop has to be fully headed and pollinating in the case of rye or full bloom in the case of hairy vetch. Those two maturity rates happen about the same time. For southeastern Pennsylvania, it's toward the end of May, although if you have high tunnels that you have been managing, it may happen you know, beginning of May uh, if you're getting the, the, uh, the heat in there. So this would be for later planted crops, not for your early ones. Uh, and I would say this is kind of rare, but I had to mention it because this is really what I do uh, and 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 so forth. And so the other thing I wanted to say is we have an option here to plant a pollinator type cover crop in the leg rows or around the edges of our high tunnels. Again, this is for more advanced management. And the idea here is to attract beneficial insects. I've, uh, I've been playing around with, it, with this. I've tried it. Uh, last year I tried it. I could maybe, <clears throat> you could argue it was a somewhat of a disaster. Uh, the weeds kind of get out of control for us there in, in this, but I'm going to attempt it this year to try to intentionally uh, attract beneficial insects, uh, insects that will will enjoy the spider mites that show up or the aphids or white flies and things like that. So again, trying to make this work here, uh, trying to mimic nature, uh, trying to set up for um, for success here while reducing our pesticides. That's where I think cover crops can be helpful in, in this uh, effort here. So <clears throat> the whole aspect of using cover crops in high tunnels, as you can gather, is, is somewhat new. There are some, in, there's some information on the internet. This is from SARE. Uh, there's a couple different uh, projects that are on there. I'm just highlighting one here. Just Google cover crops and high tunnels, and you can find various articles. Uh, and again, there is no recipe that is going to be applicable everywhere, but there's ideas here that you can use. So I just wanted to uh, to to point you in some directions here where it, it could work. Um, so... Um, just summarizing uh, what what I've talked about, I think it's important to understand this is still a new concept. I tried to share with you some ideas that I have, some things that I'll be doing this year, and uh, and and just see where we can go in this. I would strongly recommend you start small, uh, whatever small is to you, uh, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you have the ability to manage, and then learn from others. Um, this is a Kind of an emerging topic, and uh, there's there's people you might meet at conferences. You hear about people. There could be field days. Uh, this is something that we need to band together and get some creative ideas. And I would say the overarching goal is to think about how can we mimic nature. How can we mimic nature as much as possible in this effort? Uh, that's kind of the background of uh, of how this could work. So. Um, <clears throat> That is pretty much my uh, my uh, conversation here on cover crops in high tunnels. I guess, I don't know, Cheryl, if you have any other uh, clarification questions or anything else you want to talk about, uh, we can certainly do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Steve, this is a lot of great information. Uh, thank you again for mm -hmm. taking the time sure. to share with us. Um, so while, uh, you know, I am going to open it up here if, if anyone has discussions or discussion points or questions. Um, and while I'm waiting to see if anybody uh, pops in there. Okay. Um, I did want to ask about in, in your previous experience, um, as you were working through, you know, testing different methods in the tunnels, um, mm -hmm. what yield impacts did you have during that trial phase? Well, I pretty much, I guess, was on the cautious side and didn't push the limit far enough that I impacted yields. Um, it was more the management factor, the extra steps um, that, that was more of an impact. Um, I am so convinced that we can naturally manage our pests. I think that's one of my primary motivations 
for looking into this. I have seen it in my fields. I'll just give a quick example. I, I no longer use insecticides in my pumpkins uh, while they're growing. And, and it's, it's um, I'm confident. I've done it several years now. Uh, I, uh, I can't compare my uh, self with every other high tunnel in the neighborhood, but I would say that our insect, our insect pressure is certainly not higher. I would like to say it's lower, but I don't have any proof of that. Uh, we do use some beneficial insects from time to time, particularly the parsimilis for the uh, spider mites. And um, as we all know, you got to be ahead of the game on that. On that. Uh, but uh, it is it is definitely something that my goal is to to really address the the insect equilibrium, if you will. So to answer your question, I I have not seen uh, yield changes, uh, but um, I'm mainly going after trying to. Uh, reduce or eliminate insecticides. So I, I will say this, the weed control issue in crop is the most challenging aspect. And that could influence yield a little bit. Since we're drip irrigating, you know, we got plenty of water there. We can put all the nutrients we need through there. I do regularly do tissue analysis and stuff like that. Um, so um, I, I guess just to sum up your question, I haven't seen yield variations based on these experiments, but uh, it's more about the management of it. And, um, and and back to what you had said earlier about starting small. I think that that is yeah. really key, especially for someone that isn't experienced using cover crops, um, you know, whether they're testing it in the, in the field or mm -hmm. in the tunnel. So uh, mm -hmm. Francesco has a question here. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you think there is any window of time available to grow cover crops at the end of the summer? Well, here in southeastern Pennsylvania, there typically is, but it really depends on your cash crop. And is it is it finished? Is it economically finished? If you know what I mean. I mean, it depends on the prices you're getting. Sometimes it doesn't pay to go in and pick those last tomatoes the last couple of weeks. Uh, everyone needs to make the decision. Is it more important? to get a cover crop planted uh, by taking out your cash crop early or the realities of we need to make money. So do I need to leave my still producing a vegetable crop in place in order to capture that value that's still there. And that can change from year to year sometimes. So I think it's about being aware of uh, the status of the cash crop and the opportunity in front of you. And it does depend on the structural design of your high tunnel, because some high tunnels are designed to withstand a, let's just say a four inch heavy wet snow or a, a half inch coating of ice. That could happen, it's rare, but it could happen. Most high tunnels are not designed to be covered all winter. So that's a strong factor in deciding whether or not you have time to plant and what you get out of a cover crop planted in the fall. How long can you leave that plastic on? Because if you can leave it on, you know, to for a couple of weeks and can close it down and get really nice warm temperatures, then the cover crop will grow amazingly fast. But then you have to be aware if they're calling for wet snow or calling for ice that you might have to get that plastic off. So a lot of variables there to that question, um, but uh, that's pretty much the uh, understanding that I have on it. Well, and I think, you know, depending on which crop as well, you know, and you mm -hmm. reference that. And um, now you had mentioned about, you know, trying raspberries. Um, mm -hmm. And based on your experience working with others, have, have mm -hmm. you seen cover crops and tunnels uh, work well with other, you know, other crops? Uh, well, yeah, okay. I'm not. I can't share from personal experience, and I haven't seen a lot of cover crops uh, in tunnels during the crop. Uh, that's that's been a challenge. And uh, I I was over in Belgium actually a year ago, right now this time of year, and they were talking about growing um, uh, cover crops, and that was tomato uh, production there. That they were working on that, 
And I wish I would have had a picture of that, but um, I didn't have access to it. So uh, I do know that other people are doing it. As far as other crops, it's the, the principles all apply. Uh, it does depend a little bit, uh, you know, the seasonality of when your crops are. But high tunnels typically are used early and used late, and that's one of their that's that's why they're 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 used. You want to maximize the use. So uh, a lot of times there's not much time to plant a cover crop. Now, if you get a very diversified farmer who has uh, multiple different types of uh, of species that he's running through his high tunnels, then there could be op opportunities or planting windows that could open up from year to year. And you want to take advantage of that. I think that's a key here that when the opportunity presents itself, if you want to maximize the benefits this concept has to offer, you need to be ready for that. And because it does take planning, I can't emphasize that enough. If you're going to make, uh, uh, if you're going to take advantage of this opportunity, you got to be thinking ahead. It can't, usually be a, this a last minute thing is we're, we're busy as farmers and and uh it's it's usually there's there's not like we're sitting around wondering what to do uh so so that's that's just another dynamic it's kind of one more step that you have to add to your already busy schedule um steve do you have any closing thoughts i just again encourage um uh, farmers to look into this i think there's uh, beyond just trying to increase your soil's health, I see a bigger picture emerging here. And that is a more, I, I would say, transparency of how our food is grown. And customers are interested in that like never before. And now with the smartphone technology and and even there's some um, really, um, some, some what they call blockchain type of uh, identification where where customers consumers i should say are identifying where their fruit was grown and even the ability of how it was grown uh, this will play well with the general public where we're trying to use cover crops to keep our soil healthy so we can use less pesticides keep our insects in check and all that so i think there's a bigger picture emerging here that may maybe one of the best motivating factors for this other than just the the normal benefits that we can see in a farm. So I guess I would close with that challenge that uh, be thinking about where the future is going and what opportunities you may have by growing your food in a more environmentally friendly and a soil health manner. So uh, I guess that would be my final, final big picture thought on this topic today. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I know I learned quite a bit and um, I'm sure we'll have some follow-up conversation. Um, once again, if anyone has additional questions later, I will provide uh, information as to uh, how to contact Steve. Um, and we have upcoming webinars, um, and I can forward information about those as well. So Steve, thanks again. And uh, at this point, we'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. All right.